Hello, this is Dr. Kevin Garrison. You'll notice that today I'm sporting an Olaf sticker from my daughter Kendall. Um, it's kind of ironic considering we're talking about Neil Postman's uh, amusing ourselves to death. Um, and uh, both Kendall and I are definitely amused by Olaf. Um, Alright, so we are on Lecture 7 of an 8-part lecture series on writing and technology. And uh, up to this point, we spent a lot of time um, talking about what is technology and what is writing, deconstructing all common ideas about them and trying to build something from the ground up, specifically this idea of substantivism, where the medium is the message when you apply it to writing. Um, the last two lectures, I want to see if we can't grapple with, um, with practice. Um, now that we've deconstructed a lot, let's construct. What positive thing can we do to impact technology? The most obvious area that we can do that is in, is, in tech, is in education, and so thesis number seven is education is technological. It's sort of one of those duh statements, it's like uh, obvious, um, but we're not talking about um, the traditional understanding of education is technological. Most of us think of education as being technological in the sense of technology as objects, right? That um, we have our backpacks and our pencils and our pads. We go to school and buildings and we look at whiteboards and projector screens and uh, we have information imparted to us by technology and then that information is assessed at the end of the process also by technological processes. But that's not what I'm talking about. When I say education is technological, remember technology is an ideology. And so what we're talking about here in terms of the medium of the message is that how we teach impacts what we teach. It's also somewhat obvious, but I think it's less obvious. Most of the time we spend talking about in education how we can use technology to our advantage um, to deliver content better. Um, that's the wrong focus, that's the wrong question. What we want to grapple with is how can we, how does the medium impact the message? Specifically, how does teaching um, create a specific mindset in our students? So, with that said, um, it's going to take I'm going to take a roundabout way to get to the conclusion here. Um, so let's start with this big question here: metaphors. Uh, Aristotle, back in uh, um, 2,500 years ago, um, was one of the first to analyze metaphors. A metaphor, obviously, being a way that we understand one idea in terms of another idea. Um, there's been a resurgence of uh, of metaphor recently. Um, led by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson back in 1980 in their more recent book, um, um, Philosophy in the Flesh. Um, if you haven't read anything by these guys, they're both pretty intelligent individuals. Um, one of my uh, friends um, and mentors back at Texas Tech wrote a book called Metaphor and Knowledge um, back in 2005, I think, or 2003. And resurgence of interest in metaphors is that metaphors basically describe everything that we understand about our lives. Let me give you a simple example of this. Um, this one right here. Um, my daughter is a princess, right? Not literally. Um, you know, we talk about little girls as being princesses. Um, and we do so for obvious reasons. Um, princesses are beautiful, princesses are smart, princesses are highly educated, um, princesses live in beautiful castles and get to ride horses and all kinds of cool things. Um, and so when we hear about that, a little girl gets excited and says, you know, I want to be a princess, um, despite the fact that this is a metaphorical way of understanding a little girl. Obviously, she's not a princess. Obviously, Kendall's not a princess. I'm not a king and my wife is not a queen. So we're not talking about it in terms of a literal princess. We're talking about it in terms of a metaphorical princess. Now this is a powerful idea, right? Once you start to use metaphor, um, metaphors to help a, a, a kid understand their identity, then it could be a positive thing. A little kid believing they're a princess could grow up believing that they're a beautiful, intelligent individual. You can also have a very destructive impact so that uh, in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, he's singing that beautiful song about um, Someday my prince will come which uh, sort of leads to this uh, very pacifist attitude, right? Um, that a princess is supposed to wait for their prince to come, and they're not supposed to do anything besides you wait for marriage and, uh, and the two and a half kids and a white picket fence. Um, which can be a very destructive attitude for a lot of individuals. So metaphors have a big impact on how we think and how we act. 
And more importantly, they uh, have an impact on truth. Um, these are some examples that I've created from a, a text that I'm working on right now. Um, epistemology is, um, is a way of knowing. And so metaphors allow us to have an understanding of how to know, specifically in terms of truth. Now, take a look at some of these lines here. We say these lines in, um, in different contexts, considering this one. Consider this one. You lost me during that lecture. Um, that's a metaphor, right? We're talking about two people on a journey, the professor and the student. The professor is up here further along in the journey, the student's back here, um, and they've been left behind. So the professor needs to come back here and lead them hand in hand to get to that destination. But that's what truth is. Truth is some destination that we're trying to reach, and along the process, somebody got uh, sidetracked off in this direction, or they got left behind. Um, Consider this one. I, I, I use the word deconstruction a lot. Um, she deconstructed my argument by attacking the thesis. When you're talking about um, deconstruction or construction, truth is um, it's like a building. We've built something or we've torn something down. Um, or if you're talking about it in terms of attack, um, it's, a, it's a war metaphor. Um, so that if somebody's attacking the thesis, then the truth is something that has to withstand or withstood or survived the attack versus something that has been destroyed in the attack. Um, one more quick example here. He literally is an amazing athlete. I love this example here, um, especially it, um, it harkens back to some of our concepts with uh, Robert Logan and Walter Rong. Um, literally is a um, literacy um, metaphor. And we're talking about he literally is an amazing athlete. What we're saying is the truth is like a faithfully, faithfully reproduced text. Um, that's not what people mean when they say literally anymore. It's like, literally? Literally? They're always using that word even though they literally don't know what it means. It means that um, we're talking about something in terms of the text and the truth of the text. Um, and lastly, here's one, um, truth will set you free, the most common one. That we're in bonds and the truth somehow lets us be free from those bonds. Um, so, when you apply that to education, um, the most common understanding of the metaphor for education is the banking model. Um, which Paulo Freire identified back in 1970. And it works like this. Um, the students are simply um, empty receptacles um, or containers that are waiting to be filled by their teachers. And in a banking sense, um, I, as a professor, um, put a deposit of information in a student's brain, I wait for a time, and then I withdraw that information. So in a banking sense, I'm depositing information, I'm withdrawing information from a student's brain. And this, as a metaphor, um, works for helping us understand how uh, um, children are supposed to learn. It's similar to the, uh, um, the idea of a tabula rasa, a blank slate, um, so that uh, a child's mind is just a empty um, vessel, and it's a, it's a whiteboard, it's a blackboard, and you get a piece of chalk and I get to write on it. I inscribe the truth in somebody's brain. So the way that you use a metaphor um, for education or for truth dictates then how a student um, is exposed to that truth. Um, now in writing, um, or in, in English department specifically, we see a really interesting dynamic at play in terms of the metaphors that we use for understanding truth and how we teach our students. Um, the easiest way to do this is to build it from the ground up. Um, this is a James Kenevy's model of writing. Um, he says that there are three components to writing. Um, the reader, the writer, and the reality, the three R's, despite the fact that there's only two R's. <laughs> Um, the, uh, um, the reality is the context, the external reality that we are writing about or that has set the context for a needing of a text um, and it set the, the genre for which we're supposed to be writing in. The writer, the person who has something to say, and the reader, the person who has something to read. And we can use this as a, uh, as a metaphor for helping us understand how truth operates. Uh, James Berlin did that um, and he argued for the three perspectives. You take that first one, this idea of the context, the reality, and it turns it into this question of objectivity. What is the truth? Um, it's whatever the objective reality is. Um, this is very much what the banking model of education hinges on. Um, there are truth statements out there, right? Um, two plus two is four. Um, the capital of Texas is Austin. Um, if you... Uh, um, if you want to get rich, then you need to play the stock market. These kind of objective so-called truths that um, we're supposed to impart to our students so that they can learn something. Um, it also has a very strong uh, metaphor attached to it, this idea 
of, uh, of clarity, like a window pane theory of knowledge. So that um, if I have a window and I can see through it clearly to the other side, the reality on the other side, and it's not obscured by fingerprint smudges and whatnot, then um, it's good, it's objective, it's truthful. Um, you take the second one, the writer, and you can turn it into this question of subjectivity. In other words, it's a question of perspective. Um, the subjective um, model of truth implies that, uh, um, that life is about dialectic. So that somebody comes along and says in an objective sense that um, something is black. And somebody else comes along and says, no, that something else is white. Um, well, then the subjective um, perspective of truth would step in and say, well, there's got to be some kind of a medium between the two, um, and that's a dialectic way of thinking. Maybe it's gray, or maybe both are right. Maybe it depends upon the context, etc. So it's subjective, it's relative, truth is not quite so established as capital T truth, it's more of a small t truth. And he also argues that if you approach it from the reader's standpoint, then you recognize that truth is primarily about the window dressing. It's about the way that you present information, the way that mediation happens, which is a rhetorical perspective, which analyzes the how, it analyzes the form, it analyzes uh, um, the medium, and uh, it looks at the packaging as opposed to the content. Now, what really gets interesting here is when you look at this in light of an English department, um, Traditionally speaking, um, and this is not always and universally the, the case, but it helps us understand some of the tensions within um, the politics of an English department. If somebody has a tendency to be objective in the way of thinking about truth, then they ended up being something like me, a technical writer, because technical writers focus almost exclusively on this question here, the object. What is the interface like, and how am I supposed to describe it to someone else so they can understand it? It's got a connection to the rhetorical aspect, um, the user-centered aspect. What is the user bringing to the equation, and do they understand the object? Uh, the object? But um, this is secondary, and far, far away from it is the subjective perspective. The writer is basically non-existent. In tech writing specifically, most of the documents don't even get a byline, so the writer is non-existent. So the objectivists tend to be the technical writers. Um, the people who study literature and creative writing um, tend to be the subjectivist. They're very interested in a perspective um, of, of truth. Um, anybody who writes creative writing is very much um, in this mindset. Uh, um, the writer takes priority over um, the reader, it takes priority over the reality. Obviously the reality doesn't matter one iota in literature, it doesn't matter at all in, in poetry. What matters the most is what perspective the writer is trying to, um, to reach to the audience. Um, they somewhat care about the reader, but um, um, only insofar as they want to get um, widely read and widely published. Um, and then lastly, the rhetorical aspect comes into play with uh, the composition and rhetoric faculty. Um, they're very much interested in users, and specifically the, um, the readers, um, the rhetoric. And so they teach classes like 1301 and 1302, um, which are, you know, introduction to college rhetoric and courses of that nature. So, when you get um, people with these different biases, these different approaches to, to truth, um, and you get different ways of teaching, um, which is somewhat intuitive, but here's how it works. Um, if you are, for instance, an objectivist, uh, then what tends to happen is that you, uh, um, you spend a lot of time doing lectures and assigning textbook reading and um, assessing whether or not the student has uh, learned the information that you wanted them to learn, very much this banking model of education, this, uh, this window pane theory of knowledge. Um, so you're applying a quiz to the situation to find out whether or not the student has actually accomplished what they were expected to have learned. Um, and so we're really a fan of numbers um, in grades um, because it's an assessment tool. It shows us that somebody has actually accomplished some learning. Um, if you're more subjective, you realize that uh, um, the class is not as simple as just saying, here are the objectives and the outcomes, and here are the assessment tools to make sure that these things have actually happened. And in fact, learning is uh, idiosyncratic, it's difficult, it's, um, it's time-consuming, and some people are at different places along the scale. And sometimes they don't learn anything at all, what they were supposed to learn, or sometimes they learn something else in addition. Um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what the subjective aspect tries to bring out is that perspective question. Um, what is your perspective about the issues we've been talking about in class? 
So it brings in questions of reflection, of free writing, or discussions, or external criticism. So it's bringing in multiple perspectives so that we can uh, um, have a new um, understanding of truth, which um, maybe some of this, uh, this revelation or this, uh, um, we think of truth as being a hierarchy up here versus down here. And if you're a rhetorical um, truth bearer, then you would uh, um, you would do things that have real world implication for your students, such as uh, workshops that allow people to look at each other's documents and give them real world feedback, or sending the students in the writing center to get uh, a real world critique. Um, or you would uh, um, do service learning projects in your class or group projects in your class so that you make sure that students are interacting with real world audiences in the process of doing their, their assignment. So the takeaway is this, is that depending upon what you want someone to learn, specifically in a big picture sense about truth, you have to apply the correct technique to that. Um, so if you're teaching nothing but quizzes and tests and grades and lectures and, and textbook reading, then it, you should not be surprised if students are asking this question, how does this all matter? Or if all you're doing is uh, doing a subjective aspect of, of, of a class, you focus on a lot of free writing and, hey, heck, let's write a poem today. What do you think about this issue? You should be unsurprised when students come back and they say they really didn't learn anything in the class, but it was interesting to them. Um, it helped them with their emotional aspects or something like that. Or if all you do is a rhetorical aspect without bringing in these other aspects, well, they see the relevance of it in terms of their life, but they'll be asking, now, well, I didn't really learn much in terms of an objective sense, and I, sure didn't, I can't apply it to anything beyond uh, the external context I worked in. So that leads us to this question, um, the question of the reading. And so right now, um, for this week, we're reading uh, Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death. And his thesis is relatively simple. He says that the medium matters. In this case, in uh, 1985, he's arguing that uh, the predominant medium of the time was, uh, he called it a meta-medium, was television. Um, and television in 1985 was uh, the medium that was, was dictating what most people um, understood when it came to the information they were getting. And he argued this was a problem, that, um, that um, it was defeating the rationality of literacy. If, in fact, Robert um, Logan and Walter Ong are correct, then literacy is a creating a sense of rationality, linear thinking, deductive thinking, analytical thinking, etc., and television is doing the exact opposite. What television does is it comes in and says it applies or appeals to brain number one as opposed to brain number two and says, hey, let's look at the emotional things. Um, is this funny? Ha ha ha. Great, let's watch this. Um, does this appeal to me in terms of a commercial? Can I see myself uh, eating a hamburger at McDonald's? Heck yes. Um, I like to watch that commercial. And so what we see in TV is everything is just sort of a contextualist. There's lots of just random things snapped onto one another, point after point after point. So one moment we're watching uh, um, a news clip for 45 seconds, and then we shift to another news clip for another 45 seconds, and then we go to a commercial break, and we see five or six commercials in a row, all of them 30 seconds in length, and then we're right back to another news clip. And after, after the end of it, after 30 minutes of this, an hour of this, five hours of this, you can't tell anything about what you've learned, um, because it's all decontextualized. It's just random. And it's noise. There's a lot of information, and it's entertaining. It gets me excited, but I am not a brilliant thinker after watching a lot of TV. So the medium matters. The medium dictates the message. So we have to ask the same thing when, it, uh, um, when we're talking about um, 2017. We have to ask this question of whether or not um, the Internet is um, creating the exact same situation um, or something similar to it. Um, obviously, the Internet, um, with the hyperlinking and hypertextability, is creating uh, more interactive approaches, which is one of the reasons for the resurgence of rhetoric. But um, for the most part, we also know that students are not necessarily benefiting from the glut of information that's available. Um, this is one of the articles that was recently posted onto my news page back in November. And the study finds students have a dismaying inability to tell fake news from the real. And this is very much the case. In my classes, I routinely get students who quote from The Onion. If you know anything about The Onion, The Onion is a fake news source, despite the fact that it calls itself America's finest news source. It's just a joke. It's designed to be funny. Um, but students don't know that, and they read through it um, um, not realizing that it's supposed to be funny, and they're doing research on some topic, and they say, hey, I found 
found an article that matches up with that, and then they pop it in there. So they're in, unable to discern truth because of the medium of, that they've chosen, specifically the internet, which is just a glut of information. Here's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of things that you can look at. We don't do that, though. We just click on the things that we show up here on our news feed. We just click on the first link that comes up in a Google search, etc., and we apply that information um, without any kind of critical thought. So we're not able to ever get to this question of thinking critically about perspectives and about truth. We just grab onto the first thing we see and post it um, or paste it. Now, how does this matter in a big picture sense? It matters in this sense. Uh, um, this is an article I published back in 2012 um, for the Media Ecology Association. Um, my argument was built off of uh, Alul's argument, which was pretty simple. He said that there were three major malus, um, which is the French word for environment, that had happened um, through history. And he argued that they were um, predicated largely on these um, different shifts in terms of discourse, um, orality, um, early writing systems, and then print literacy. And each one of these had created a specified environment, um, the natural environment, the social environment, and the technological environment. I argued that uh, since he passed away in the early 90s that we've uh, seen another radical shift. Um, Alul, like Postman, was very critical of, uh, of television, um, but he also recognized, um, unlike Postman, that uh, computers had a pa the possibility for reconceptualizing our technological system. And I argued that um, if he had lived a little bit longer, he would have suggested that we've gone into another direction, this idea of the fourth milieu, which is what I called my article. My mom finds that hysterical, and the way she memorizes it is by talking about skip, skip to my loo. Um, I think it's funny, but uh, um, in a serious sense, what we're talking about here is this new virtual milieu. Everything has been reconceptualized by virtuality um, using digital systems. Our cell phones, our computer systems, our laptops, our cloud-based computing systems, our artificial intelligence, um, our interactive uh, um, virtual reality systems, our computer game systems, everything has become virtual very quickly. And so each one of these is stacked on the other. The other milieu don't disappear. Um, this just becomes the overriding metaphor or narrative to help us understand the previous one. So the, the natural world still exists, but um, we don't engage with it hardly ever. In fact, it works in a backwards manner. Most of us spend our time inside, in front of our computers, or with our faces in our cell phone, in a virtual world. Um, that depending upon our technological systems that we've created, such as the technologies we use, considering the environments that we're in, such as the buildings and the air conditioning, etc. Um, and in the backdrop of all of this is the city and the, the, the social laws and mores that hold it all together. And underneath all of that is the natural world that still exists way out there somewhere, but we don't actually have any contact or touch with it until somebody posts a picture of it on Facebook and go, oh, how pretty that is. Um, so as each one of these discourses changes, um, we see a corresponding change in the way that we see and understand the world. The last but not least, it gives us this, uh, this really nifty little graphic that Polsky and Gorman created two years after my article came out, um, one of the few citations I've had on mine, um, where they created this nifty, nifty little ch um, image, uh, this illustration. And it works like this. Um, at different points in history, we've seen uh, the oral, the written, the print, the electric, and electronic worlds coming into play. Um, they basically use the electronic world for what I would call the digital world. Um, the electric is uh, um, more things like television and radio and telegraphs and things of that nature. Um, but what we have to remember is that each one of these serves as the foundation for the other, so that um, we are still dependent very heavily on an oral um, form of communication. We're dependent upon our students learning some basic forms of literacy and handwriting ability. Um, they also need to understand how to read a, a complex book. Um, they need to understand how to use television, radio, um, not necessarily telegraphs anymore, but uh, um, taking pictures and photographs and other old school technology. And most importantly, they need to understand how to work within the virtual world. And of course, it doesn't always happen in a very linear format. Um, most of them have to learn how to speak before they can do these other things. But um, they may be working with a printed word, um, like my daughter is right now at 16 months, reading um, um, you know, these big um, paperback books um, or the, um, the, the cardboard books. 
Um, at the same time, she can already use the touch screen surface on a phone, poking buttons and creating certain apps that she wants to see. Um, learning words at the same time, um, she loves TV, which is an electric um, um, technology, etc. And so she's learning all of these um, simultaneously, despite the fact that historically each one of these was built upon the other. So what it all means at the end of it is that and we have to remember that um, the truth is um, dependent upon the way that we present it. And the way that we present it is dependent upon the technology that we adopt and specifically the medium that we use to create that. Um, so when it's all said and done, um, we get to the end of amusing ourselves to death. And he says, um, in a very sardonic way, he says um, that the big question we have to grapple with is uh, what are we supposed to do? Um, how are we supposed to teach our students? What are we supposed to do to make sure that they don't entertain themselves to death? And he says the desperate answer is to rely on the only math medium of communication that, quote, in theory, is capable of addressing the problem of our school. And then he says that it's not such a happy idea. He says this is a conventional American solution to all dangerous social problems. And it is, of course, based on a naive and mystical faith in the efficacy of education. Anybody who's been in public education knows this. But we're not talking about public education per se. We're talking about anybody who has a role as a teacher. Someone who can, in fact, choose what kind of information they want to impart what kind of tools they're going to use to impart it, what kind of assessments they're using, and in fact getting away it's scrapping from that banking model of education entirely and saying, let's look at this from a rhetorical standpoint, or let's look at this from a subjective standpoint. What type of truth are we trying to apply to our student? And he said the big question we have to ask is this, not how can we use television or the computer or the word processor, processor to control education, but instead ask the other question, how can we use education to control television or the computer or the word processor? So that ends this lecture. Um, one more to go. Goodbye.